Okay, why don't we get started, folks? Uh, good evening, and welcome to today's final literary Zoom lecture in our Homer's Odyssey series, brought to you by the Wilton Library. And a special welcome to our waitlisted guests who are watching through our YouTube live stream. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager here at the library. And I'm very pleased to be introducing this lecture, which is made possible with the support of the literary series in memory of Amy Quigley. Before we begin, just the first a few notes, your microphones and cameras should be off and it is important that you keep them off during the program. Also, because we have a large audience, we'll handle the Q&A at the end as follows. You can send me your questions in the chat window and I'll ask them to Mark after his lecture. And as in the last three weeks, we have a lot of material to cover. So the Q&A will be rather short, maybe five minutes, just to have a few questions at the end. And as usual, Mark is happy to answer any questions that you direct to him later by emailing him, and I will give you his email address. This has been a great series, and I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have. It's a shame it has to end, but we look forward to having Mark back in the fall to take us through James Joyce's great novel, Ulysses. Mark. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and thanks everyone for uh, showing up. We do have a lot of ground to cover and I will answer any questions promptly that I get by email later today or subsequently. So what I wanna concentrate in talking about these last six books is once again on the rhythm and pacing of the epic in this last quarter as it remains not just land bound, but house bound. It becomes very much a domestic story as I'll explain, and the pacing has something to do with that. I want to say something, of course, about the plot, and then I want to remind ourselves that it's first and foremost always a poem, and what are some of the poetic aspects of these last six books. So to review the, the last three books from the last section, very briefly, book 16, which presents the reunion of Oedipus and, I'm sorry, Odysseus and Telemachus in the course of a single day, ends with the word sleep. And then book 17, which shows the continued impiety of the suitors and a growing chorus of voices hoping and praying for the suitors to quote, eat their last, ends with dusk was falling fast. And book 18, which presents uh, Oedipus winning a boxing match uh, and with the relatively uh, gracious uh, infinimus recognizing viscer viscerally that the punishment the suitors will undergo will consume him also. In other words, the tide turning towards the household. That concludes with uh, their end of day uh, scene as the suitors, quote, drank their heady wine to their heart's content and went their ways to bed, each suitor to his own house. So sleep, dusk, and then going to bed. The effects of these three single day books is to underscore the real time progression of events in this part of the epic. And to suggest that, Oedip um, I'm sorry, I keep saying Oedipus, this is because I teach that play a lot, oh, excuse me. Um, Odysseus's planned revenge, it's to suggest that his planned revenge has the force and the inevitability of the natural progression of the days. Um, when he's on his long voyages, every trip, every chapter doesn't begin with dawn, but many do. And they are to suggest just how long he's away one day after another, because it's not clear that there's a progress, he's wandering. But here we're in the midst of a plot, there is a progress. And these three chapters of the last quarter, ending as I've described, give a sense that time is ticking down to zero hour. In book 19, beginning with where we're talking about tonight, uh, uh, Odysseus confirms his identity with his old uh, uh, nurse, uh, your client, uh, after she recognizes in a flash that he has the scar of his master. And in a flash is a atypical word in this uh, very deliberative pacing. Uh, it's also the book where Penelope announces the 12 acts archery challenge, 12 again, like the 12 uh, uh, 
uh, slave, female slaves who are going to be executed later, like the 12 gods uh, in Olympus and so on, a kind of round number in many cultures. There are different reasons for that. Also, just so you understand, the challenge that she sets is that these uh, axes have some kind of circle or hook by which they can hang. And they're going to be lined up so that those circle uh, are form a kind of tunnel through which a very straight arrow could pass without being obstructed. That's the challenge. Whoever can do that will win her as a bride. This book also ends with the word sleep uh, as it describes Penelope's weeping for her missing husband. So another single day book. Book 20 has the beggar enlisting the cowherd, Felicius, and the, uh, the swineherd, adding him to the swineherd, Eumaeus, uh, to the cause of revenge without revealing yet that he's their king and master. And those two men, those two lowly men, are going to form the quartet uh, with Telemachus and Odysseus to uh, carry out the revenge. Now, this is significant. There must be higher level servants in a king's household. There must be some kind of um, personal secretary or head butler or chief cook. There must be some household organizer. But what Homer has is the lowest three people, the old nursemaid, the swineherd, the cowherd, these very low level domestics being the people who Odysseus shares his secret with, and for two of the three of them, actually enlists them, these old men, uh, to help him with his task. That emphasis again on uh, domestic, uh, household, native land. So he enlists them. Uh, beyond the plot, book 20 is significant poetically because it enacts an extended comparison uh, a long or complex metaphor or simile is called a conceit, C-O-N-C-I-C-E-I-T, uh, just meaning conception, very common in 17th century British metaphysical poetry. Instead of finding a point or two of comparison between this and that, it finds many points of comparison. And the conceit in this chapter that we've heard before is that of comparing the revenge act to a meal or feast. Early in the book, we encounter an epic simile as Odysseus debates how he should proceed with killing the suitors and struggling, we are told, to curb his fighting heart. The epic then continues with this epic simile. So this is, this is uh, only about 25 lines into book 20. He's struggling with himself to resist acting uh, recklessly. And the poet says, so he forced his spirit into submission. The rage in his breast reigned back, unswerving, all endurance. But he himself kept tossing, turning, intent as a cook before some white hot blazing fire who rolls his sizzling sausage back and forth, packed with fat and blood, keen to broil it quickly, tossing, turning it this way, that way. So he cast about, how could he get these shameless suitors in his clutches, one man facing a mob? That's a remarkable comparison. You would not think, as you set out some thousands of lines ago and maybe a month ago to read this poem that you'd find the hero king home being compared to a cook quite, quite trying to broil his sausage. Uh, it's an apt metaphor only in the sense that it's part of this conceit, this kind of light motif of the relationship between uh, vengeance and a meal served horrifically as if there's something equally sacrificial, rich ritualistic about the sacrifice. There's a long tradition of uh, meals enacting sacrifices of a religious or nationalistic uh, nature. So this motif of revenge as a meal continues when the unnamed woman grinding grain responds to a thunderclap by asking Father Zeus to have the suitors, quote, 
eat their last. This is book 20 around line 133. She refers to uh, their string of groaning feasts. Uh, that is uh, around line 131. Groaning feast because it makes you groan to see how they're abusing the household. Immediately thereafter, either because he overhears this or by an act of telepathy, and I should note that telepathy is a cousin of Telemachus, I think, but we can leave that for another day. Uh, Odysseus responds to that comment, uh, the same omen of the thunderclap, by assur assuring himself that he will, quote, ground the scoundrels' lives into revenge. Now, ground can be a metaphor or an image that has nothing to do with food. Um, you can ground uh, something into dust like gunpowder. But the context here is that you have a woman grinding grain. Just, I can empty those. Just lines before, just a few lines before uh, Odysseus makes the same comment. For the second time, Odysseus ducks and avoid being struck by a thrown object. Uh, these patterns of repetition appear often throughout the epic. Uh, the fact that he's not hit uh, by this ox uh, hoof thrown by a suitor is another evidence that the tide is turning. Uh, the feast that's coming up is for the celebration of Apollo. And it's worth noting that he's the god of music and poetry and significantly archery because not only is archery how Odysseus is going to win the contest, but he does a lot of his slaying uh, with his bow and arrow. Uh, and that feast is going to turn horrific, the, a feast for Apollo, again, god of light and music and poetry and the arts, a god of civilization. Uh, that's gonna turn horrific as Athena has the doomed suitors break out in a crazed laughter it is not their own. And we're told that, quote, the meat they were eating oozed red with blood. Uh, and that's book 20 around line 358. The seer, Thea Cleminus, uh, has a vision of the great dining hall dank with blood. That's around line 394. So from early to late in this book, the imagery is of a blood soaked revenge that's a kind of meal. And the book ends with a question and answer uh, that caps the revenge as blood feast uh, that has been uh, depicted throughout the book. And this is uh, in Fagel's page 423, the end of the book, uh, book 20. And it ends this way. They're finishing up lunch. And the question is, what's supper gonna be like? And these four lines are the conclusion. But as for supper, what could be less enticing than what a goddess and a powerful man, Athena and Odysseus, would spread before them soon? A groaning feast, for they'd been first to blot, plot their vicious crimes. And so groaning feast turns to a feast of groaning men, a feast of pain and suffering, not making the household groan, but they will be groaning. Book 21 opens with the terse sentence, the time had come only to have the fulfillment of that statement delayed by a history of Odysseus's bow, the gift of the bow that's gonna be so significant in both the plot and the symbolism uh, of the story. Uh, these excursions or detours where we're moving forward and you would think that a chapter that begins the time had come, would immediately pull the plot forward into the revenge. But these digressions are part of what's called ring uh, composition. And you might think of it this way, if you drew a horizontal line from left to right to talk about the day after day forwarding of the plot, when you get to a place like the ring or earlier how, um, uh, Odysseus got his scar, you can think of it as a detour that goes down and around uh, in a uh, clockwise circle so that it returns back to where it started. It's a kind of detour that doesn't advance the plot, but returns you to where you were in the middle of whatever narrative. Uh, and that was a kind of scenario within a scenario 
and it helped the bards who had to uh, memorize the poem know that, oh, and then when we turn to the revenge, there's that bit about the bow. Uh, and so this is another one of these, hurry up, the time had come, but delay, let me tell you about the bow. Penelope adds another dimension uh, to the challenge that she offered earlier. Uh, before a suitor can attempt to send the arrow clean through all 12 axes, he must also first string Odysseus's great bow. She had mentioned that earlier. Uh, uh, the bow becomes an image of domestic life in that we're told uh, that the great Odysseus never took it abroad with him, that it, it is not a battle bow. It is a bow for hunting, for having at home, and it's another image of the domesticity of uh, this part of the poem. While several suitors fail at the task, Odysseus reveals himself uh, uh, to Eumaeus, who was part of the plot but didn't know it was Odysseus, and Felicius, the swineherd and the cowherd, by means of the scar. That is, he binds himself to these lowly domestic servants by means of his vulnerability. He doesn't show him, them, a birthmark that is part of the household of Laertes. He doesn't have a decoder ring or a secret handshake. He binds himself to them through a wound. Uh, and that's significant because there is a tradition older than the Odyssey of the type of the wounded healer, uh, the person almost always a male for sexist reasons, uh, that is it's men who are composing these stories, um, someone who is both damaged himself, but going to uh, repair the land. It's the Fisher King in the old vegetative mists that show up in the wasteland. Uh, it's the Christian Messiah uh, in that Jesus in order to heal uh, humanity of its sins must first be wounded himself. And this idea of the wounded healer whose act of intervention is also an act of consanguinity, being one of the people he's helping, uh, whether it's the myth of God becoming man or the king who just condescends to be a fisher, uh, a, a, a fisherman in order to feed his people. This is part of that uh, tradition, this sort of general uh, cognate idea, cousin-like idea of the wounded healer. When the two most outspoken and irreverent suitors want the beggar not to be permitted to attempt the challenge, Telemachus takes control. I hold the reins of power in this house, he says, at uh, book 21, line 394. And uh, Penelope takes herself up to her room uh, to prepare for the next chapter. But this is another one of the sequence uh, where the prince keeps acting more and more princely um, and more and more his father's son. And I'll read you this passage, uh, which is uh, at the end of the book, end of book 21, and I'm starting around line 451. And I wanna point out especially how Odysseus is compared here to a singer on the day of the Feast of Apollo. This man of war, this crafty man, uh, this man of voyages is compared here to a bard. So they mocked, but Odysseus mastermind in action once he handled the great bow and scanned every inch. Then like an expert singer skilled at lyre and song who strains a string to a new peg with ease, making the pliant sheep gut fast at either end, so with his virtuoso ease, Odysseus strung his mighty bow, the weapon like an instrument. Quickly, his right hand plucked the string to test its pitch and under his touch, it sang out clear and sharp as a swallow's cry. Horror swept through the suitors, faces blanching white and Zeus cracked the sky with a bolt, his blazing sign. And the great man who had borne so much rejoiced at last that the son of cunning Kronos, that is the Titan Kronos, the father of Zeus, flung down that omen for him. He snatched a winged arrow lying bare on the board, 
the rest still bristled deep inside the quiver, soon to be tasted by all the feasters there. Setting shaft on the hand grip, drawing the notch and bowstring back, back. I want to, want to see again, this is a, if this were a movie, this is a close up. That's that microcosm. Setting shaft on the hand grip, drawing the notch and bowstring back, back, right from his stool, just as he sat, but aiming straight and true, he let fly. And never mix, missing an ax from the first ax handle, clean on through to the last and out the shaft with its weighted brazen head shot free. So he made it like, uh, like Lin-Manuel Miranda's uh, Hamilton, Odysseus finally gets his shot. So like, uh, and then book 21, the book we're in concludes not with the end of the day, which we've been accustomed to for the last four books. There's no dusk, no supper, no sleep, but rather in the middle of things. And I return now to Odysseus just having made his shot. He paused with a warning nod. And at that sign, Prince Telemachus, son of King Odysseus, girding his sharp sword on, clamping hands to spear, took his stand by a chair that flanked his father, his bronze spear point glinting now like fire, dot, dot, dot. So not only isn't it the end of the day, it's not even the end of this event. It stops in the middle of things as one challenge has been met. That is, no one else now can marry Penelope. And of course, the fact that he not only strung his own bow, was able to use it, but succeeded as challenge is implicitly telling people this is Odysseus. And so the chapter ends, the book ends, but not the sequence. It's going to pick up very quickly. Uh, and that's different. And the difference is because we've been habituated over the last several books uh, to the end of the day and waiting till the next day. So book 21, the book we are just looking at, concludes not with the end of the day, but with this um, uh, striking in the middle of things. So uh, the next book uh, involves, excuse me a second. I inadvertently skipped a page. So we're in book 22. And within the first 100 lines of the book, Odysseus has killed Eurymachus and Telemachus has killed uh, Amphinomus. That is uh, the most outspoken of the uh, suitors. And in a matter of another 245 lines, all the other 106 suitors are dispatched by the quartet of Odysseus, Telemachus, um, uh, uh, Felicius and Eumaeus, the quartet of domestic men, king and prince, cowherd and swineherd. The bard and the herald are spared uh, because they are men of art. They are singers and singing matters in this poem. Remember, it's a bard who's telling the poem. But the 12 female male slaves who have disgraced the queen and shamed the household are hanged uh, in a line uh, like birds strung up by a snare. And this is a hotly contested issue uh, about the humanity of that. There's a lot of uh, argument back and forth about whether this was significant in Greece, Greek culture, uh, why 12? Well, there are 50 women, uh, female slaves really, uh, who are in the household and this percentage, 24% of them, that round number again, 12, are to be killed. There is a ritualistic dimension to it. They are hanged, which is the execution of lowly people. In Shakespeare's day, for example, in the Henry plays, if you were somebody of honor and to be executed, you would be beheaded uh, uh, consistent with your rank. The queens of Henry VIII who were executed were, um, were uh, beheaded. But if you were a lowly person, or you wanted to be, you, they wanted to communicate that you would be treated like a lowly person, you would be hanged. Um, in the Fagel's translation, he translates Homer's expression of the women as whores. And in Wilson's more recent translation, uh, she not only translates, but she makes the argument that they should be thought of as girls or just serving women or more 
appropriately slaves. Uh, I don't mean that it's not significant, but the speed in which it's done and passed on is part of the accelerated pace of the entire book. Uh, and then after that, um, in conclusion, there's uh, to the ritual killing, the house is cleansed, ritually cleansed. And uh, Odysseus is united with the other women of the household. And we're told that deep in his heart, he knew them one at all, uh, one in all. So he's figured as a kind of patriarch where all of the servants in the household who surround him are the serving women. And the only men mentioned are the people who have joined them in the revenge. Book 23 is a very significant book. It's the recognition scene between husband and wife by virtue of the secret sign of the bed. Uh, if you read the section, you know that um, when Odysseus talks about moving the bed, uh, he's going to reveal that he must be Penelope's husband because the bed was carved out of a tree that was rooted and not moved. And the bedroom was built around the immovable bed. He also, once they're united and they sleep and make love, he shares with her that he has one more trial that he was charged with uh, by Tiresias uh, in the land of the dead. And this you remember, uh, so it's told earlier by Tiresias and then in typical Homeric style, it's repeated here in the last quarter of the book because there's a task that Odysseus must face that uh, occurs after the end of this book. He has to take a well-planed oar, and well-planed is significant. You may have noticed that uh, references to uh, Ed uh, Odysseus's house in these last several books always talks about it being either sturdy or well-constructed. Uh, that's not braggadocio. That's the mark of culture and civilization in the same way that we've had all the scenarios of bed making. Uh, this is what a culture does. It makes sturdy and well-constructed homes and it ma makes a well-planed oar. Craftsmanship, artifice in the sense of made things, artifacts matter. Tiresias told him he must take this well-planed oar and carry it over his shoulder and walk inland as far as he can, that is away from the water, until he gets so far from water that someone mistakes the well-planed oar for a winnowing fan, that is a paddle to hit grain. When he gets to that point, he's to bury the oar in the ground. He's to sacrifice um, um, uh, animals and he's to build a shrine to Poseidon so that these people who knew nothing of the water, otherwise they would know an oar when they see one, will get news of Poseidon. He will pay his debt to Poseidon by becoming a kind of missionary. But the token that he will use is an artifact, a token of civilization made out of wood in the same way that the bow is made out of wood, in the same way that the bed is made out of wood. This seafaring wanderer comes home and many of the points of significance either of recognition or trial are around, not wood in its natural form, but wood cultivated into something else. So, um, so once again, as with books 20, 21, 22, Book 23 does not end with nightfall. Uh, they make love and talk through the night, they sleep, and now it's the next day. And the quartet of warriors, this group of father and son and the two uh, herdsmen, leave town in daylight, except that they're shrouded in darkness by Athena. That is, you know that if night and day have been inverted, it's another affirmation that the tide has turned for Odysseus and his household. So if we add to the wood of the oar and the bed and the bow, uh, the recognition scene in book 24, which does 
three, uh, three things, the final book. There has to be the reconciliation, the meeting of father and son, Laertes, who we're told is an orchard keeper out in the countryside. There has to be some uh, justice uh, for the family, some retribution, and there has to be some diplomacy so that there isn't endless killing of the families of these hundred plus suitors uh, against uh, Odysseus and his household. That's the work of the last book, uh, book 24. So when he gets to see his father, there's a lot of conventional stuff about whether he'll test him or not, and whether the father will recognize the son. This is part of the suspension of disbelief. Uh, that's an old tradition of uh, a 10 or 20 or longer absence of a family member leads you to suspect that maybe this is not the son who left. Um, it's partly uh, an image, an issue of how long the person has been away, transformed by years. It's partly an issue of how the person might have been transformed by suffering. And it's certainly an issue of how the person uh, fits part of the mythic pattern of how am I going to recognize my own kin. What's significant is this recognition scene and this acceptance occurs across three generations, son and wife and father. Well, Laertes is convinced that Odysseus is his son by two reasons. One is the scar that is a mark uh, of vulnerability on his son's body. And the other is the fact that his son, uh, the stranger must be his son because he remembers when his father first planted an orchard. And you may say, well, the orchard are trees in their natural state. So there goes the notion of artifact, but an orchard are not trees in their natural state. They're cultivated trees. They are as much a product of civilization as the well-planed ore or the bed or the bow. So another touchdown is based not on nature, but humankind's translation of nature into an artifact, here the cultivation into an orchard. And we remember that the Cyclopes are savage in part because they don't plant, they don't sow or reap, they just eat what they find and it's part of their savagery. So the issue at the end the very end is how is it not going to be bloodshed? Uh, Odysseus has asked Athena earlier, how is it that they're gonna be able to keep the peace at the end? Uh, and she sidestepped that by saying, don't worry. Well, it's not for nothing that the uh, guardian angel of Odysseus throughout the epic, but especially in the last quarter has been the goddess of wisdom and not, for example, the goddess of war, the god of war. It's not Ares who helps Odysseus figure out how to kill a hundred men in short order. Uh, it's the goddess of wisdom. So in the end of it, uh, the very fifth, last 50 lines or so of book 24, Laertes kills the father of one of the suitors. So you have a father killing father uh, and then um, Athena cries out in a piercing voice that stopped all fighters cold. If you're in the Fagels, I'm at the top of page 485, the last page. Uh, if you're in another translation, it's about 15 lines before the end. Hold back, you men of Ithaca, back from brutal war. Break off, shed no more blood, make peace at once. Remember, she is disguised as mentor a wise man. So Athena commanded, terror blanched their faces. They went limp with fear. Weapons slipped from their hands and strewed the ground at the goddess's ringing voice. They spun in flight to the city, they're in the countryside, wild to save their lives. But loosing a savage cry, the long enduring great Odysseus gathering all his force, swooped like a soaring eagle, just as the son of Kronos hurled a reeking bolt that fell at her feet, the mighty father's daughter, and blazing-eyed Athena 
wheeled on Odysseus crying, royal son of Laertes, Odysseus, master of exploits, hold back now, call a halt to the great leveler, war. Don't court the rage of Zeus who rules the world. So I'm gonna pause here for a moment. Uh, if you have to suspend belief to say, if Athena could do this so easily, why shouldn't, couldn't she have uh, frightened the daylights out of the suitors? Or why shouldn't he, she have commanded other things? The point is that on the brink of war, she speaks in such a ringing voice with such force that they run in terror. Um, that is, blanched their faces, limp with fear, weapons slipped and strewed the gown. That's before the lightning bolt. Uh, her ringing voice is contrasted with the savage cry of Odysseus, who is gathering his force and is going to follow the men who are retreating. What we're to understand from this is that they've been frightened away by mentor's godlike ringing voice, and they're terrified. Odysseus has not learned his lesson and has to be reined in by the goddess. Hold back now, call a halt to the great leveler, war. Don't court the rage of Zeus who rules the world. And the constantly erring Odysseus finally listens to her and the poem continues, so she commanded. He obeyed her glad at heart. And Athena handed down her packs of peace between both sides for all the years to come. That is mentor, the diplomat, the daughter of Zeus, whose shield is storm and thunder. Yes, but the goddess still kept mentor's build and voice. So, uh, the dipl diplomacy is in the person of an apparent human being in Mentor, but it's the goddess's voice. And here, I want to emphasize two things. Again, the, the sheer brilliance of this poet or poet's idea to have the four touchstones be uh, cultivated wood uh, of the bow and the bed and the, and the orchard and the planed ore in the order in which they show up are uh, all uh, elements of civilization. And then the striking thing that this poem that has been filled with so much violence, uh, supernatural violence, natural violence, human inflicted violence, accidental violence, uh, so much uh, savagery ends with a pact of peace and a diplomat, uh, Athena in the person of mentor, uh, giving orders and the last word of the Fagel's translation is voice. The last word of the Robert Fitzgerald translation is the voice of mentor. That's the last phrase. I don't know in the Greek if the syntax has voice being the last word or mentor being the last word, but that's splitting hairs. Either way, the last line of the poem is a celebration of diplomacy and voice. And the first word of the poem, you might remember, is sing, sing muse. So this amazing, extraordinary epic about all kinds of adventures and supernatural happenings begins with the word sing and ends with the word voice. That is what's being celebrated is the very poem we just read. The ability of human beings to sing uh, the way the bards are spared uh, bards are ble the, the, the most blessed breed of, of human beings are bards, uh, the way that in his final act of achievement, uh, uh, Odysseus, who earlier was compared to a fry cook, is now compared to someone who can play a lyre or violin or something like that with virtu uh, uh, virtuosity. Uh, this notion that would make civilized people civilized is singing and talking. That idea that I've mentioned several times that the highest praise uh, in Homer's poems for a Greek um, statesman or king or warrior is that they are talented in war and talented in council. And so when I said at our first meeting that if the Iliad is a poem of war, really an anti-war war poem, uh, this is a poem of peace. 
uh, of uh, domestic peace. And I hope I've shown you that it's not just a matter of the plot, uh, but the imagery that at this point in the poem, you could compare the returning hero king to a cook because he's going to serve up revenge. Or what I've said about the several chapters in a row beginning and ending in one day and giving you a sense of the passage of time. It's not boredom. It's the fact that the clock is ticking down like a movie where calendar pages are falling uh, off the wall. And then this extraordinary ending with not just peace, but voice, because that's what makes civilization, not the act of building a ship, not the act of, uh, of conquering uh, a citadel or city of an enemy, uh, but the act of being able to make peace. True, after horrific slaughter, Homer has it both ways. Uh, you get the bloodshed uh, and then you get uh, the peace. But a remarkable close, and I continue to think that one of the great conceits, um, extended metaphors or motifs in all of world literature is those four works of cultivated wood, those four objects, if you consider the orchard also as an object, uh, that bring the hero back home. So uh, I'm happy uh, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, I wanted to end somewhat earlier than usual. I wasn't sure whether we cover it all because uh, if you have questions that you think are germane, not just to what I said or what I've talked about this afternoon, uh, but maybe to the arc of the whole series, uh, I, I prefer to answer good questions in public because other people get the benefit of them. And that's my practice in my own teaching and classes. So Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mark. Once again, great, uh, great lecture, very stimulating, very thought provoking and brought it to a great conclusion. Uh, interesting question from a few minutes ago and it may contrast a little bit with how you concluded your lecture. The person says, some scholars have said that book 24 doesn't fit well with the rest of the Odyssey and is unhomeric, perhaps especially with the scene in Hades. Can you elaborate on those kind of comments? Do you think book 24 is a fitting ending? Is a what ending? A fitting ending. Yeah. So once again, I, I want to make it clear. I can be wrong, and I'm wrong with some regularity. But I want to say I don't come to this poem uh, as a Greek scholar. Um, what I know about ancient Greece, I mainly know through the literature that I've taught, including especially the great Greek tragedies uh, and these two great epics. So I'm not sure I'm knowledgeable enough to be able to say what's Homeric or not. And it's certainly true that the way that the Odyssey came to us uh, was a varied career. But it's also true that the final manuscript that was revealed uh, beyond the Middle Ages seems to have been confirmed as bona fide. If the ending isn't particularly Homeric, it may have uh, the, uh, the, the vices of having to sum up a story with a kind of literal deus es machina. What's pre what prevents the bloodshed that Odysseus quite reasonably thinks is going to follow? He's just killed, presumably, the eldest son, even if some of the suitors are brothers, the eldest son in scores of uh, Greek families, uh, some of the best families, presumably of Ithaca, have the men among the suitors. How many uh, families can there be in Ithaca that can give these suitors over? What's going to prevent, prevent a civil war. Logically, nothing. There'd be bloodshed. But uh, in the old tradition of a god or goddess comes down and makes everything okay, that's the ending. If it were just that, if it didn't fit the poetry of the poem, I'd say that it's a flawed ending. But it fits the poetry of the poem perfectly because Odysseus is once again just lying before the end of this poem about to say, make the same mistake. He's got his back up, he's angry, and he's going to go after these fleeing suitors until he's stopped by wisdom and finally accepts 
that he shouldn't do what he wants to do. That's certainly in keeping with the poem. And the idea that uh, peace comes through diplomacy, who packs of peace that we're not going to be troubled with, is very Homeric. We've seen how much diplomacy and speech and talking matters, how singing matters. And the final point I made about beginning with the word sing and ending with the word voice uh, is spectacular. I don't mean my point is spectacular, although you're welcome to think that if you like. Uh, the, the construction is spectacular because think of how often speech animates this poem. Uh, reports, arguments, narratives, false or true, um, uh, trying to convince somebody by evidence that you are who you are, that person resisting. Uh, a lot of what happens in the book is based on human discourse uh, and, and godly discourse as well. That the poem would begin with sing, praising the bard, and end with voice, praising the diplomat, is very Homeric in my view. Great point. So this question is another one about translations, and I know that you kind of addressed that last week. I'll just read it to you, and then I have an idea myself. You mentioned yeah. Wilson's translation, and this person was wondering how you would rate it in comparison to the more classical translations. She has read it and found it very lively and contemporary. Yeah. And I was wondering if maybe uh, one way people could get a sense of different translations, at least styles and approaches, might be to go back to your material from the first week where you gave various translations of the opening of the poem. What do you think about that? Right, right. So uh, is that still posted, Michael? Um, it is. I can resend that to people. I sent it to everybody before the first session. Okay, so I'll, so I'll say this. Uh, that posting of the uh, opening of the poem in several translations was my nod to try to be teacherly beyond the four hours that we have time together. That's why I also posted a handout for every one of the sessions, including the one for this evening, which has a lot of the information about the wood issue of the cultivated wood that I've just mentioned. It's worth repeating. Uh, and the reason I, I did the translation is to first remind us all that it is a, a work that has been translated. Uh, the translation is an art. Uh, and different people come out of different ways. Uh, the Wilson, more recent translation, uh, she's decided that it's important to have a poem that had a meter of its uh, nationality, of its, uh, of its culture, be translated into a meter of English culture. And her argument is that um, iambic pentameter, uh, the uh, choice of Chaucer, uh, is an appropriate meter for the regularity of her translation. Uh, there are certainly felicities in her translation, which I have not read, but sampled. But as I mentioned in correspondence with one participant who wrote to me, to my ear, uh, an English translation in iambic pentameter uh, does not seem Greek to me. It, it doesn't seem song-like. And one of the things I like about Fagel's and this is not an argument to persuade you, this is how I came to uh, gravitate to Pagels, is his long lines uh, seem Greek to me, uh, only in comparison to when I've heard recordings of people reading the ancient Greek, which is very much long lines of a kind of wailing poetry. And part of the issue is that if we could translate it into English, uh, with long lines of wailing poetry, I don't think it would be felicitous to the 20th or 21st century English speaking ear. For better or worse, I have become enamored of the Fagel's translation. I can say that if you want to, and in an internet age, many of these translations are online, you could pick a passage of the poem, not necessarily opening, that you particularly liked because you found it very moving uh, or beautiful or important in terms of your understanding of a poem or confusing that it calls your attention from one reason or another. Uh, and then you could sample how that passage, uh, most translations have a guide that tells you the line roughly in the original. Uh, and you could look at, at least online, I'm sure, 
five or six or more translations of that same passage. Uh, translations are very thorny thing. And Michael, you'll have to remind me, did I not mention uh, my friend who translates Shakespeare plays into Indian uh, dialect? Did I not mention that? Uh, I don't, I don't think, you, and I don't think you did, or you might have uh, been maybe in the first session. Uh, well, it's a story I tell so often, I, I apologize that I can't remember, but I'll be brief. Um, a man I know who translates Shakespeare's plays into American Sign Language has a colleague who translates Shakespeare's plays into the regional dialects of the Indian subcontinent. And there is a scene in a Henry play, I think it's Henry the Four, Henry the Fifth, where a countess uh, or duchess is waiting for news of her son's uh, exploits on the battlefield. And a messenger comes to tell her that the son has been wounded, but will survive. Uh, he'll survive. And she thanks him for this news, which she says has uh, warmed my heart. And this man who has to translate that line translated as translates it as cooled my heart because in India, nobody wants their heart to be warmed. <laughs> Good news does not warm you. It cools you the way people are hoping for a cool breeze today. And so there's a perfect example. In order to get it right, he had to translate it 180 degrees differently. Uh, and that's just a, a kind of interesting, uh, but just one aspect of translation. Translators have to decide, do they want the language to sound like the music of the original language, or do they want the words and the idea is to be closest to the words of the original. And of course, there are languages in which we can say, there's no word in that language for this. There, there's just no good word for that. Right. Uh, because I'm not a Greek specialist, I come to this poem the way I come to all poems. I'm a reader and teacher of poetry. Uh, when we do um, Ulysses in the fall, you'll see that although I know a lot more about James Joyce than I know about Homer, um, I come to it the way I would come to any novel or work of art. What are the patterns of repetition, of opposition? What are the patterns of repetition with a difference? Someone throws something at Odysseus and it hits and hurts him. The second time they miss, the third time they miss again. That's a pattern. Um, I, I come to it as a teacher of literature rather than a specialist in ancient Greek literature. Great. And I just want to add a side note um, to what you're saying about the music of the poetry, that uh, your, your whole series, starting from session one, it literally did inspire me to take one of the great courses. I think we all know how those great courses are put together. And I, I actually began studying ancient Greek three weeks ago in order to ultimately be able to understand it well enough to read the beginning of it in Greek. <laughs> well, that's impressive, Michael. And I wanna say that everybody take note. And when he finishes his course, you can ask Michael the question about <laughs> which translation is best. I was gonna say, so, I'll get back to you in a year. Up, I was gonna say, I'll get back to you in a year when I'm capable of doing it. Uh, I, we had one other question. Uh, yeah. Does Homer, through the Iliad and the Odyssey, offer a discernible moral standpoint on killing? Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I hope that in the near future or the distant future, I have an opportunity to do a series on the Iliad, uh, uh, ideally at the Wilton Library or somewhere else. Uh, I, I'm very grateful for the invitations I've had from Wilton, I'm not lobbying. But the great thing about the Iliad is it is a war poem written by a Greek uh, about a battle that the Greeks succeeded in. And yet there is nothing chauvinistic about the way the battle scenes are depicted. Uh, whenever someone either of name significance or relative unimportance is killed, there is a, a very graphic description of how they are killed. The spear going through uh, the jawline uh, into the eye socket, uh, breaking, breaking open uh, an artery, um, the, the idea of who will be grieving about this dead man in the future. There is nothing 
celebratory uh, about uh, warfare. And telling also is that you would expect, uh, since we know they knew about the Trojan horse, you'd expect that a really cool ending to the Iliad would be the Trojan horse. That's how the Greeks destroy the city. That's the culmination. Uh, it's not mentioned. It's not mentioned. It's not only depi not depicted, it's not mentioned. How does it end? It ends with a truce like the Odyssey, a pact of peace, a temporary truce in the Iliad so that the Trojans can have their funeral games celebrating the death of Hector. That is, the Greek poet writes what could be a nationalistic or chauvinistic poem about this great mythical or possibly historical battle against a major enemy that the Greeks won. And the last line of that poem is that they allow the Trojans to do um, reverence to Hector, comma, breaker, of horses. Breaker of horses is like Laertes being an orchard keeper. It is an activity of civilized people, not wild horses, domesticated horses. And this prince, Hector, is the son of Priam, brother of Paris. He's not invoked at the end as golden helmeted or shining helmeted Hector, which is what he's called on the battlefield. He's not extolled as a warrior. He's not referred to as a prince. He's referred to as a, as a ranch hand, a breaker of horses. That's as moving to me as the ending in the Odyssey about mentor's form and voice. That's the glory of Homer. He writes an anti-war war poem that is about a Greek victory that doesn't end with the victory, but a celebration of the death of the enemy as a man of civilization. It doesn't get better than that. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so I think uh, that was the last question that I had from the chat box. And I think that's a very good way to conclude on that point. Uh, once again, Mark, thank you very much. It's absolutely brilliant, wonderful. Uh, we've gotten a huge number of compliments from the attendees over these four weeks. I'll share some of them with you when I get around to copying them into a Word document for you. And, and when you send them to me, Michael, in English, please, not ancient Greek, okay? Don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll look forward to having you back in the fall with, uh, with uh, Ulysses. And uh, instead of traveling around the Mediterranean, we'll travel around Dublin for a day. And, um, and we'll work on the Iliad. No need to lobby for that one. Okay. And let me say, uh, Michael, thank you to you and everyone in your a library who made this possible. Thank you to everyone for coming. It helps me a lot to know that although I have to look at myself only each week when I do this, I know that you're out there. Uh, and I wanna wish everybody a healthy and safe uh, July 4th holiday and uh, a celebration of independence, however you do that. And I will see you on the other side. Thanks again, Michael. Thanks, Mark. Okay, good evening, everybody. Have a nice evening and we'll, we'll see you next time.